Willkommen, bienvenue. Welcome. Ehrengäste. Computer Scientist. Mathematicien. Glücklich zu sehen. Nous sommes enchantés. Happy to see you all here in Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Willkommen, bienvenue. Welcome. In Heidelberg, a Heidelberg. To Heidelberg. Meine Damen und Herren, Mesdames et Messieurs. Ladies and Gentlemen, guten Tag, bonjour, good afternoon. Wie geht's? Do you feel good? Comment ça va? Wir sind Ihre Konferenziers, nous sommes vos maîtres de Zeremonie. We are your MCs. I am Mamata Vadacharya, a 2018 HLF alumni. Ich heiße Felix Günther, et j'ai visité le HLF en 2013 et 2015. All right. So before we further continue, a bit of housekeeping. This entire event is audio and video recorded, and there will be photographs taken throughout the event. But we have two rows at the end of this room, and if you'd like to not be captured in photographs and recorded, please feel free to use them. If you want to follow this year's Edelberg Laureate Forum on social media, or even share your own experience and unique impressions there, we would like to draw your attention to our hashtag HLF19. And as always, when you're traveling through the World Wide Web, we ask you to accept our cookies. They will be served at the Bavarian evening and on Thursday, and you will recognize them by the hashtag HLF19. This year, we have 23 laureates representing Fields Medal, ACM Turing Award, ACM Prize in Computing, and Nevelina Prize. We are very fortunate and honored to have their presence and hear from them. So without further ado, Let's welcome our esteemed laureates. I would like to request you all to please rise in honor of the laureates. Welcome in. Bienvenue. Welcome. Bienvenidos. Dobro pojalvat. Vitamu. Namaste. Di lua di lenga. Benvenuti. Bei vindo. Hoskeldinis. Wan ying. Swagatam. Uyu mukelva. Kushamadid. Vidite. Juzu pari. Alan vosalan. Ikabu. 
Bun Vinit. Malo Malam. Dopro Dorschli. Ciao Mung. Willkommen. Mujirare. Bari Galust. Salamate de Tang. Las Cave Prossimo. Kalossia Fate. Shagotem. Riago Amogela. Piliganime. Welcome. To the seventh, seventh Heidelberg Lawyer Forum. Forum. It has taken more than a couple of billion years of evolution for us to reach at this point in time, 2019. 2019 also marks the 50th year since the first man human landing in Moon, an event which marks as a milestone in scientific advancement where both precise mathematical approaches and engineering excellence made this incredible achievement for mankind a reality. In the last 50 years, a couple of long-standing mathematical conjectures were proven. Just think of Fermat's last theorem that was solved by Andrew Wiles in 1994, or the Foncari conjecture that was solved by Gregory Perelman in the beginning of a century. Many fields of mathematics became crucial for our daily life. Number theory is used in cryptography. The theory of PDEs is used in the simulation of fluid dynamics, and differential geometry is used in modern architecture. We also saw the emergence of new fields in mathematics, such as the mathematics of deep learning and of data science. In the field of computer science, we have seen tremendous advancement in the last few decades, from computers that used to be of the size of a room, to the tiny smartphones in all our pockets, which is able to do audio-video recognition, augmented reality, among many such applications. We thus, also, machine learning and artificial intelligence helps physicians to conduct surgeries now, help physicists to identify distant galaxies. We thus very proudly stand here in 2019, welcoming you all to the 7th Heidelberg Laureate Forum, where you, dear laureates, the greatest minds in mathematics and computer science, have gathered here to inspire you all, dear young researchers, the shining stars of tomorrow. We are so glad to have you all here in Heidelberg. A big welcome to you all. I completely forgot to introduce Momita to you, I'm sorry. Oh. Momita received a PhD in computer science in 2018, and during her PhD she developed machine learning models for disease protection and precision medicine. And 2018 was also the year that she visited this Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Currently, she is a senior scientist in Etsy, a two-sided marketplace. She works at the headquarter in New York, and now her research again focuses on developing machine learning models, but now for recommendations and search. Thank you, Felix. And Felix received his PhD in mathematics five years ago. This was just in between his two participation in Heidelberg Laureate Forum in 2013 and 2015. After research, he stayed in five other European cities. After that, he came back to his alma mater, Technical University of Berlin, to continue his research in discrete differential geometry. In addition to his participation, in, uh, in addition, as a researcher, he participates in Science Clan, and his hobby is a mathematician. <laughs> Thank you, Mamouti. As you know, one aim of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum is to bring mathematicians and computer science together to let the borders yep. between mathematics and computer science disappear, to combine the theory of numbers with a computation. And how this can be done in a magic way, you will now see yourself. For this, you will have to do some calculations. Please feel free to use your smartphones and use calculator app if you wish. If you do not have a calculator app, no problem, you can also use your head, huh. but you may want to think about a small number in a second. Are you all prepared? Then, oh, let's you're not start. kidding, you have to do some math now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do the math. Okay. okay, think of any positive number. A number with a finite number of digits, so pi is not allowed. Now, multiply this number by nine. Then, if you have it, take the sum of the digits of that number. I do see many of the young researchers not doing the calculations. <laughs> <laughs> they just do it in their head. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, take again the digit sum. And finally, subtract one. 
Now, the result we get, we will call n. Now, what is, once we have n, what is the nth character in Latin alphabet? For example, the first character in Latin alphabet is A, and the fourth character is D. Now, think of a university town in the south of Germany that starts with this letter. <laughs> At three, we ask you all to say the city you are thinking of. One, two, three. <laughs> Heidelberg. <laughs> If you wonder why all of you said Heidelberg, you can ask me later. <laughs> yeah, we are very, very pleased to welcome you all here in Heidelberg, a city that most of you have never visited before, or quite a few of you already visited Germany. Due to some troubles at the Frankfurt airport, some of you before, um, arrived even before the luggage did, but don't worry, relax, enjoy the ceremony, HLF is taking care of everything. In fact, for some of you, it's the second time in Heidelberg, just as it is for me. And for those of you, you already know, HLF take care, takes care of us, right? This time, it is at least my eighth time in this wonderful city. Ooh. But one of the young researchers visited the city even more often. His top tip is to visit the Christmas markets, which you unfortunately cannot find in September, but this gives you a reason to come back to Heidelberg in winter. Now we would like to call up on stage Andreas Reuter, the scientific chairperson of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Professor Reuter, the stage is yours. Good afternoon. The regulars in the audience will know that we constantly change parts of the opening ceremony in order not to become 100% predictable. This year, our Masters of Ceremony, suggested that I should drop my usual routine and do a science slam instead. I improvidently agreed, not understanding that I would have to educate myself on the subject of science slam before. I did. I'm not sure I really captured the whole thing, but I learned two things. For a science slam, you have to talk fast and you have to not exceed your time limit. So that's pretty hard, but I will try anyway. But first, I would like to welcome our participants and guests. As in each year, it's a pleasure to welcome the laureates. Thank you for donating so much of your time to the cause of HLF. It's also a pleasure to welcome the young researchers, many of whom had to overcome substantial obstacles, some bureaucratic, some logistic, to get here and join us. Thanks for being so persistent. It's my pleasure to welcome the speakers of this afternoon, Michael Meister, State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, Theresia Bauer, Minister of Science, Research and Education and, uh, and the Arts, excuse me, in the state of Baden-Württemberg, and of course our landlord, Bernhard Eitel, Rector of Heidelberg University, who generously lets us use this building and many other facilities of the university to stage HLF. A warm welcome to the presidents of the award-granting institutions, Cherry Pancake of the Association for Computing Machinery, Hans-Peter Graver of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, and Carlos Koenig of the International Mathematical Union. Thank you for many years of very enjoyable collaboration. A cordial welcome to our guests, who followed our invitation to attend HLF. I hope the experience will be rewarding for you. And last but not least, I would like to welcome members of the Chira family, Gerda Chira, Harald Chira, and his wife, Sigrid Hubeni. Thank you for joining us, and of course, thank you for upholding and sustaining Klaus Chira's decision to support HLF. We really appreciate this. <clears throat> In the remaining eight minutes or so, I will do my science slam, and the subject will be the early history of HLF. Uh, it may sound like just a little, uh, not enough time, but it's actually a lot of time because in all honesty, it didn't take much longer than that to implement the real thing. Um, so we will see why. 
In 2011, Klaus Schirer and I were discussing how to raise the visibility of our recently founded Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. In August, I sent him a mail with a couple of suggestions, one of which is copied on the slide up there. Uh, by the way, AR stands for yours truly and KT for Klaus Chira. Klaus' response came a couple of days later and essentially settled the issue because he said, if it's not unreasonable, let's do it. And by the way, let's include the mathematicians. Um, so we followed that uh, direction and the first step was to figure out how the award-granting institutions would react to such a proposal, what the scientific community in general would think about it, and, most important of all, what the laureates would think about such an idea. If any of those groups had reacted negatively, we would have scrapped the idea right away. We started our inquiries through two channels we already had good connections with. One is the research center in Oberwolfach for mathematics, and the other in Darkstuhl for computer science. Both of them were extremely helpful. Uh, it's important to note this. Uh, they opened many new contacts for us, and in some cases they became something like ambassadors for the project. The two quotes up there are the first from a Turing laureate who we contacted early on, and the second from a director of one of the collaborating organizations. The award-granting organizations also were very quick in giving us at least the preliminary go-ahead, and the foundation for the Lindau Nobel Laureate meetings reacted very favorably too. Of course, all the details still had to be worked out. There was nothing there. But in principle, everybody involved was positive and supportive. And mind you, this was the end of November, a mere two months after the idea was launched first. Then came Christmas, the holiday season, nothing much happened during that period, except that a meeting was arranged with all the relevant organizations and some laureates in order to work out the basics for this new endeavor. The date was February 7, 2012, and these are the participants of this meeting. A uh, picture was taken in the studio Villa Bosch, uh, the home of the Klaus Trier Foundation. And quite a number of the people in this picture are still here today, which I think is very interesting. Uh, Joseph Sifakis uh, is here, uh, Willy Jäger is here, Gerd Martin Greul is here, um, Gerhard Schimpf is here, Helge Holden is here, uh, and maybe if I forget somebody, just raise your hand and say I'm also here. But nevertheless, thanks for supporting us from the first minute on. This half-day meeting produced a large number of results, most of which are still valid today. If you don't want to read the whole thing, just focus on the portions highlighted in blue. One result was discarded shortly after. That was the name. Um, and I will get to that in a minute. I think you can appreciate why. The suggestion for the subtitle, that's the last blue line, shows that originally we wanted to cover three prizes, the ACM AM Turing Award, the Abel Prize, and the Fields Medal. This also was sl changed slightly later on. This mail illustrates an effect that Beate Spiegel will talk about uh, right after my presentation. Um, the presence of laureates in Heidelberg creates a real cornucopia of ideas of what else they could do, where else they could talk, other than at the HLF. Um, and, well, it's just interesting that it started very early. By the end of February, the naming issue was finally resolved. Nobody was really happy with the acronym proposed by the brainstorming meeting, and many other ideas were circulated uh, among the participants of this meeting. Uh, and at some point, Gerhard Schimpf picked one version which immediately won the support of Joris Hartmanis, he's a Turing laureate, um, and his email is quoted here. And subsequently, everybody else joined the bandwagon, and this is the title we still use today. Uh, this, the plural S was dropped at some point for linguistic reasons or whatever, um, but other than that, um, that's the name. Of course, we needed a logo. Today, you need a logo for everything. Um, and this is what the graphics artists proposed. I think you can appreciate why Klaus Chira and Beate Spiegel at some point decided for the logo we still use and love. This headline says it all. Plagiarism is the highest form of praise. And of course, HLF is singing the praise of the Lindau Nobel Laureate meetings. This was quite explicitly our model. 
And actually, this was a case of assisted plagiarism because the Lindau people helped us a lot in setting up HLF, defining its structure, and so on. They were accepting two of our staff, Ruth Wetzler and Jasmin Käse, as interns for the 2012 Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting, um, and some other things that we will talk about later. And just to introduce some people, here is Countess Bernadette. She's also here today. Welcome. And Nicolas Turner back there. Um, he's also in the audience. Here, back there, is Ruth Wetzler, and partly hidden is Jasmin Käse. So, um, and by the way, this is Nobel laureate Dan Schechtman in the attire for the Bavarian evening, um, a tradition which we also copied from Lindau. Uh, and you may copy his attire. So, in, on the occasion of the Abel ceremony in Oslo in May 2012, an agreement was signed between the HLF Foundation and the award-granting institutions on the collaboration in the context of HLF. This agreement was limited for a trial period of five years, just to figure out would this thing work and do we want to continue, etc., etc. At this occasion, actually, uh, IMU suggested that we should adopt a second of their prizes, the Nimmer Nina Prize, uh, as part of HLF. We did which meant that the agreement we just signed was immediately out of date, um, but nobody really cared. Uh, we signed a new agreement, one which is more accurate and more up-to-date, four years later when it was decided that HLF would be continued uh, beyond the trial period. This is not exactly an org chart, but it shows the key players in the HLF context. I would like to draw particular attention to the reviewers. The reviewers do a tremendous job in looking at all the applications, evaluating them, ranking them, et cetera, et cetera. In this round, it was over 800, um, and this is not an easy job. And they do it very, very consistently every year, and they get very little attention for that. I think this is a good occasion to thank them by a round of applause for the reviewers. Thank you very much. So, in November 2012, basically one year after we started, the applications round opened, uh, and uh, in the first year we got about uh, 1,600 registrations, which boiled down to uh, close to 600 applications. And the first HLF was held in September 2013. At the closing sessions, the participating laureates were asked whether HLF should alternate between computer science and mathematics, as was originally planned, or whether it should be kept together. In the beginning, uh, I think if we had taken the vote then, uh, we would have gotten like a 50-50 answer. At the end of the first meeting, all but one laureate were in favor of the joint model. And this is what we have been doing ever since. I would like to close this with a copy of an email that Abel laureate Raghuvaradan sent out right after the first meeting to his fellow laureates. And he talks about some important issues, but he closes with something which really describes what the heart and soul of HLF is. The unfettered interaction between laureates and young researchers, the next generation of laureates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Beata Spiegel, chairperson of Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation and the managing director of KTS Foundation would also want to welcome you. I would like to echo Andreas and welcome you all to the seventh Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Dear young researchers, guests, members of the press, and of course, laureates, thanks to each of your contributions that make the HLF such an impactful event. Each of you shares the understanding 
of how fundamental an abbreviation for mathematics and computer science is, and for that, thank you again. As Andreas already mentioned, in just a matter of months, the HLF grew from a brazen idea to the Heidelberg Laureate Forum that we know today. I remember the first HLF clearly, both the excitement and, yes, the uncertainty of whether everything would unfold according what we had envisioned. The excitement has survived. The uncertainty has faded. Each year, the forum becomes more rooted, more established, and more recognized in its role for mathematics and computer science to be an open platform for exchange between disciplines and across generations. The HLF's impact is not just visible, it is also tangible. During the week, you have the opportunity to examine ideas together, face to face, eye to eye. Such a concentration of great minds eager either to relay their experience or to seek advice on current project produces sort of an electricity, a charge that is transferable. This creates an energy you can feel throughout the forum, but that extends beyond this week and what happens here. It is safe to say that the laureates with their lectures, their participation and their experience, that is what draws attention to the HLF. Nowhere else do the recipients of the Abel Prize, the ACAM AM Turing Award, the ACM Prize in Computing, the Fields Medal, and the Levandlina Prize come together under one roof to impart their knowledge. The current state of mathematics and computer science would look very different without the work of those individuals sitting in the front rows each of these young researchers has not only treated their past you have laid, many are using the tools you made possible to push us into the future. Wisdom unshared is wasted, something that each one of these pioneers understands. The laureates do not limit their participation to the forum itself. Some visit local schools or institutes in the surrounding area. Having the prospect of meeting such prominent scientists has not gone unappreciated. And this year, we had a record number of schools requesting visits. Local institutes have also seized the chance to host some of the laureates, even invited them to hold a lecture, much like at the HLF, captivated their audience. As homage to our blueprint, the Linda Noble Laureate Meetings, an HLF Laureate is invited to Lake Constance each year to present the Heidelberg Lecture in Lindau. Inversely, we host the Nobel Laureate to give the Lindau Lecture here, the physical representation of our steadfast alliance. Last year, one Laureate received the Karl Theodor Prize granted by the so-called Metropolitan rhein -Neckar, Metropolregion rhein -Neckar, an association focused on improving the future of this metropolitan area. Ripples of the HLF extend throughout the region, but do not stop there. Instead, they continue on. We make an effort here as well to ensure that the waves of that appreciation for mathematics and computer science are renewed throughout the year. Fascinating exhibition like the one accompanying this year's program, La La Lab, the mathematics of music and various other events are organized to excite the young students and the public about these imperative fields. Interests will lie dormant if not awakened. We provide programs that are designed to activate that curiosity. However, our reach can only extend so far. Young researchers in the audience, all of the discussions and connections that lie before you this week, those will follow you back home. Do not be hesitant. You are not here to waver or to be uncertain. 
You are here because you were selected from a deep pool of applicants and you made your mark. There are more some 60 countries represented here today, many more institutions and universities. Your experience at the HLF is not something you leave here in Heidelberg. This week, the exchanges you have, the ideas that are born, all of it that is yours to keep. You decide what to do with it. The HLF is one conference, one week, but it's filled with countless opportunities. Opportunities that either create direct impacts or open the door for them to be made. Even if an impression does not extend past the conversation of those that experienced it, it was shared, it was real, it was meaningful, it made a mark. Impacts have consequences, they create ripples, and where the ripples finally dissipate, it's difficult to measure. We always look forward to this week. If for nothing else, we feed of the energy that is so magnetic. But it's because we know that even when the program has come to an end, that impact has begun. And I know that Klaus Chira would be very pleased that the ripples made by your discussions carry on. They travel beyond what we can see, beyond on what we know, into the expanse where all of you feel so much at home. Thank you. Since last year, we had to mourn the loss of three laureates from the HLF community, Sir Michael Atia, Jean Bourguin, and Fernando José Corbato. Please rise in their honor. Thank you very much. Sie haben Ihr Manuskript? Ja. Sie haben Ihr Manuskript? Bitte. Ihr Manuskript? Habe ich. Okay. This year, we have a wonderful group of young researchers. Quite a few of them have interest in subjects beyond computer science and mathematics, whether in the form of the graduate, undergraduate courses they take, or the interdisciplinary nature of their research, including subjects like philosophy, geography, history, or politics, and backgrounds such as physics, biology, chemistry, cognitive science, and neuroscience. That is super impressive. Some of you, some of you young researchers, also are interested in multiple languages and language study, including German literature, East Asian language study. Also, what we observed, which was super impressive, is the number of languages you speak. On an average, most of our young researchers speak up to three languages. I used to always be super proud that I can speak five, but two of them, two of the young researchers, speak six languages. Kudos to that. Not only languages, but also music attracts the interest of several among you. One of you studied classical music composition, another one was in a conservatory for sacred music and knows how to play the organ. So if you want to celebrate a mass today, just look around to find her. <laughs> if you prefer chamber music instead, no problem. Our young researchers can play the piano, flute, violin and clarinet. Also fans of rock music might find their band here, with people playing the guitar, drums, electric bass, double bass and keyboard. Perhaps you will listen to a jam session in traditional Chinese music, hearing a Zhong Yi Shen, a Gu King, and a Gu Zhang. My most favorite combination would be that the piano, bass, guitar, and drum players as a rhythm section join uh, the trombone, trumpet, and alto saxophone players, oh. and they all join our band balance action to form a big band swing arrangement. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> Now we have a treat. We have a very, very special performance by Charles Gray. Charles is a musician and a mathematician. Her achievements in the field of music are countless. She has been a musician for 20 years before she decided to pursue her other passion, mathematics. As a musician, she worked as a freelance piano accompanist. She taught in universities at Australia and extensively worked for Australian Music Examination Board. She has three bachelor degrees, hmm, arts, music, and mathematics, and two master level theses in music and mathematics. And currently, she is pursuing her research, her PhD in statistical meta research. Charles says that what she loves the most about music was the study of patterns within it, and that she chose mathematics because of her love of music theory and its patterns. Today, she's going to play a piano piece which she composed especially for this event. The composition is called Tessellations from Epilogue to Heidelberg. So without further ado, let's call Charles Gray on stage. Hi. I'm just going to grab my So, you know when someone says something to you and it makes 30 years of your life flash before your eyes and you don't know how to respond. People, I, I do a lot of coding now. Uh, I code in the language R. I'm an R lady. And people often comment on how fast I type. And I think about how this actually is only a tiny part of how music prepared me to become a mathematician. I, in that moment, I think, well, there were two instances where I really worked on speed. Uh, one was when I was quite young, I was about 10. And then there was another instance when I was studying at the Conservatorium of Music in Melbourne, and I was about 22. In each case, I spent a few years really drilling my fingers to try and get dexterity. I'd work with the metronome. Metronomes measure beats per minute. I'd set it to 60, play one note per second, two notes per second, three, four, five, and I was eventually got my way up to 16 notes per second. And I was pushing and pushing, trying to get my hands as fast as I could so I could play Rachmaninoff and Liszt. And when I was doing that, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that this would be the perfect preparation to be standing here before you and sharing my love of mathematics. Music was the perfect preparation for mathematics, and it wasn't just dexterity. I want to share with you some of the other aspects of how music prepared me to become a mathematician today. When we listen to music, we're doing algebra. When we compose music, we're writing a proof. I feel like I'm, it's a natural extension, and even though I never imagined I would end up here, now that I'm doing it, it feels like the most natural thing in the world after studying music theory for so long. My last thesis was in order theory, less than or equal to. What is that? It exists in music too. We can have less than or equal to in music. The first note is lower on the page than the second note. We have the note A followed by the note E. The first note is less than the second note. What is less than or equal to? Well, I'm an order theorist. This is a Heidelberg Laureate Forum, so we're not going to shy away from mathematical definitions. <laughs> An order must satisfy three properties reflexivity, anti-symmetry, and transitivity. So if x is less than or equal to x, it's reflexive. If x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, then x is equal to y. And finally, transitivity. If x is less than or equal to y, y is less than or equal to z, x must be less than or equal to z. Transitivity. When a binary operation satisfies these properties, we say it is an order. But we can extend this further not just less than or equal to, we can start to play around with this. Music is made up of ostinati, patterns. And we can think of these as algebraic homomorphisms. What is a homomorphism? Well, here's our formal definition, and, and we could think of it as, uh, you know, the, the image of, of uh, an operation is the operation of the image in the codomain, if we want to get all mathematical. But this is easier to understand with pictures. An order-preserving homomorphism. 
this one's an isomorphism. We've preserved the structure entirely, but all I've done is change the colors. So here on the left, I've got my domain mapping over to the codomain. And my greens are mapping to my yellows. My purple is mapped to the blue. And the structure of it has stayed the same. All I've done is change the colors, but it's essentially the same thing. Well, this exists in music everywhere. Here's an example from J.S. Bach. So here we've got a little motif. And you can see from the shape of it, it goes up and then it comes down. And then, again, we've got the same shape. It goes up, comes down. The structure is preserved, but all of the notes change. So our first motive sounds like this. And our second motive sounds like that. All the notes changed, and yet it sounds the same. We have a homomorphism, an endomorphism. We call this a diatonic sequence. We can give it names within music theory and within mathematics, but we can think of it as kind of the same thing. We can play around with homomorphisms. If I map over into the codomain and reverse my operation, so on the left-hand side, I've got less than or equal to, on the right-hand side, greater than or equal to. I preserved the structure and flipped it. An order reversing homomorphism is what we order theorists would like to call it. And of course, we can do this in music. We take our motif, and we can do what in music, musicological theory, we would call an inversion. Bach's full of this. Again, you can hear a sameness of structure, right? Even though the notes have changed. And in this case, the order has changed. We've reversed it. And yet, there's a sameness there. This example is from Invention number 14 in B flat by J.S. Bach. And uh, I learned this piece of music when I was eight years old. And I remember looking down at the very bottom of the page and it said, this motif has been repeated. It was a little footnote in my edition. It said, this motif has been repeated 68 times in the piece. In fact, the piece almost entirely comprised of homomorphisms of this motif. There was almost nothing else in it but this motif. This is what Bach does. He does algebra. Bach's an algebraist, in my opinion. Ostinati. We can play around with this. Now, music, music is, is made of all these patterns. Some of them are melodic ostinati. An ostinato is just a repeated pattern. Bach repeated that pattern 68 times. But we could also have rhythmic ostinati. In the piece of music that I have put together for you to show you how we can put together different ostinati, I repeat rhythms. So I have this rhythm. repeated through it, and I can change which notes I'm playing that on, but the rhythmic ostinato remains the same. Similarly, I can have harmonic ostinati. That's where we repeat the same chords. Pop music is full of this. If you've ever heard the phrase four chord pop song, that's because the same four chords have been repeated over and over and over throughout it, so you end up with a harmonic ostinati. And finally, we have melodic ostinati, which is what we were having a look at with the Bach examples. And we can combine these ideas in a way that I think is, is analogous to tessellation in mathematics by layering our patterns together. Here I've got an example that I took from Wikipedia. This is a Penrose tiling. I'm sure many of you have seen various different tiling patterns and tessellations in your studies and research. So we can think of musical composition as a tessellation of musical ostinati that have been put through homomorphisms. Some of these homomorphisms are really boring, like the identity map. For example, if I take this melodic motif, two notes, but if I repeat it, I begin to build a melody. Maybe it's a boring melody, but once we start to tessellate these things, we can start to build interest. Each of those tiles is simple and boring on its own, but the tapestry of the combination of them all becomes a beautiful picture. So we're going to combine rhythmic, harmonic, and melodic ostinati to make a piece of music. And you will listen, I will play, and we will do algebra together.
Push it off. Arts for this Wonderful amazing piece of music. Do you want to come here? Oh, sure. We have a couple of questions for you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm really interested. Where did you get the inspiration from for um, tessellations from Epilog to Heidelberg? And can you tell us more about the process of actually composing a piece of music? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so when I was invited to Heidelberg, um, they, I was invited to play piano. Uh, I was actually uh, visiting Le Centre International de Rencontre Mathematique in Marseille in France uh, to do some research for the Big Data and Social Good Conference. And uh, they heard me playing piano in the auditorium. And that's how I came to be invited here. So I was asked to play a piece of music. And I thought, well, what? what would be appropriate for a mathematics conference? And I had this little idea of a piece that I'd put together for a student uh, about a decade ago. And he was interested in composing, and we were discussing contemporary minimalist music by uh, Philip Glass, Jan Tiersen, uh, Michael Nyman, composers like that. And I was talking about how they're filled with patterns and how you could just about write music with an algorithm. And I, I was writing out this algorithm for him of how to compose a piece of music like this. And I thought, well, I'm the teacher. I should put my <laughs> money where my mouth is. And I should actually do my own exercise to show him before the lesson. Because um, I'm writing this little sort of sketch, and I'm thinking, this is quite straightforward. I should be able to do this in an hour. So I sat down and I set myself the task of, you know, write a piece in an hour. And I didn't quite finish it. I had a sort of an idea of it. And, but it was, I thought it was quite pretty. And then I never finished it. And it, went into a drawer. So uh, when I was asked to perform for Heidelberg Laureate Forum, I thought, ah, oh, I have this algorithmic piece of music that I never finished, and it never really took full shape. So I thought, this is the perfect thing to finish this piece of music. I always felt it was quite cute. It was you know, a nice little melody. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity and the inspiration to put it together. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Wow. If that was one hour's work, then kudos for that. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> also, what would you, I'm like really interested to know, what would you say was your biggest challenge in marrying these two worlds, mathematics and music? Like, what was the most difficult part of it? You know, I don't, I, until very recently, I didn't feel like my arts education had really had any input into my mathematics career. I really oh. felt like I started all over again. I went through my undergraduate in my 30s, uh, you know, and, and of course I, I did analysis, I did topology, and my exercises were, you know, I was just like everyone else. But now that I'm writing papers uh, and doing research and being given a little bit more freedom, I'm starting to let my, my arts background run a little wild. So something I've been doing is uh, uh, basing every research paper around uh, a text, a novel. So my last one was mm. based around a play by David Auburn that won the Pulitzer Prize. It's called Proof, and it's about mathematics. Uh, and I structured my paper as a conversation between the two characters in that play. Um, wow, I, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. My current paper opens with Kafka. So <laughs> <laughs> That's such an inspiration for writing papers as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lovely again. Thank you for ha having us, like letting us hear the lovely performance. Oh, Thanks thank a you. lot, Let's Charles. Let's hear it for Charles again. Uh -oh. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Well, now you and I have to perform a little better, given how much competition we have. <laughs> well, now we will stay with mathematics. We would like to ask a mathematician on stage, Michael Meister, who is State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and member of the German Parliament. Dr. Meister, the stage is yours. Distinguished laureates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to once again represent the Federal Ministry of Education and Research at this year's Heidelberg Laureate Forum. There is hardly any other event format that better exemplifies openness and team spirit among researchers across generations. So thank you very much for inviting me to this year's Laureate Forum. 
you young researchers in mathematics and computer science here, today will have the unique opportunity to meet with the best in your field. Take advantage of the immense wealth of experience at hand and find yourselves a mentor. For the experienced scientists among you, your job is to act as role models for the next generation and pass on your experience and knowledge or perhaps let it be called into question. It is this spirit at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum that I find so remarkable and commendable and as a medican, mathematician myself, it fills me with pride. Distinguished guests, our society is facing a number of profound challenges at the outset of the 21st century. Most notably, the challenge of the climate change, which is already impacting ecosystems worldwide and the lives of countless people on a massive scale. It is the science community's duty to play its part in solving this problem. Not only that, there is no and will be no solution to the global climate crisis without science. This year's hot topic at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, climate crisis, facts and actions, proves that mathematics and computer science are doing their bit. Two days ago, the federal government adopted a national package of measures as a part of an international initiative. The package covers innovation, incentives to reduce CO2 emissions, CO2 pricing, and regulatory law. We have already achieved a great deal. We have cut our CO2 emissions in Germany by more than 30% since 1990. But we must and would like to do more. The objective is now to reduce greenhouse gases by 55% compared to 1990 levels by 2030 and to become greenhouse gas neutral by 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research takes a strong interest in supporting mathematics. It is a discipline of key importance for our society in many respects. Not only are the general principles of mathematics applied in natural science, but one also mustn't underestimate the role of maths as a driver of progress. Maths helps to make the lives of many people around the world more convenient, better and safer. Research that works for the benefit of people, that is what is important to us at the Federal Research Ministry. In the funding priority, Mathematics for Innovations, we support applied mathematical research projects to the tune of about 5 million euros per year. The aim is to find solutions to complex social issues through new mathematical methods and put them into practice. Mathematics provides the basis for various mathematical modeling, simulation and optimization process. Huge leaps in progress have been made in recent years, for example, in the area of personalized medicine or future-proof energy grids. There are countless further examples of application ranging from establishment of digital networks, aviation, vehicle design, construction to the humanities, and social science. Ladies and gentlemen, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum brings together young researchers from the one of the most traditional scientific disciplines and one of the newest. It creates interdisciplinary networks which play a key role in the development of state-of-the-art technologies such as artificial intelligence 
or big data solutions. And it is exactly in these areas which we in Germany and Europe must excellent and lead. Demand is high for digital methods that help to process and link together large volumes of data. The ability to forecast when, where, and to which extent we will feel the effects of climate change, for example, is extremely relevant for society. The CASUS Center for Advanced System Understanding, funded by our ministry, was founded just a few weeks ago in Görlitz, Saxony, to improve such forecasting. Novel digital methods will be developed in interdisciplinary teams to establish a systematic understanding of complex phenomena. Ladies and gentlemen, when I take a look around the audience and see so many excellent young scientists, I cannot help but make a further point about an issue that is fundamental to both the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and the Klaus Scherer Foundation. And that is MINT, or what in the English-speaking world is known as STEM, MINT education and the promotion of the next generation, MINT researchers. We start our MINT action plan, which pools previously available funding, but also marks the kickoff of new initiatives. Examples of initiatives include MINT learning opportunities for young people, which will support locally in regional clusters. The setup of a MINT e-platform as a networking forum and support for MINT researcher projects to answer questions such as what are the elements of good education in MINT? What are the required conditions for MINT education to succeed? And what can we learn from experience gained abroad? In all of these measures, we will seek to inspire more girls and young women to pursue a career in the MINT sector. The Gender Gap in Science panel here at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum is sure to discuss this aspect in great detail. By recruiting and promoting young talent is only one side of the coin when it comes to securing long-term excellence in science. The other side is science commun communication, something which Klaus Scherer recognized when he said, good research needs to be understandable. Ordinary citizens expected a culture of open communication in science. It is becoming more and more common for people to reach out to researchers online and on social media and engage in many different ways. And without a doubt, there is no lack of exciting topics to discuss. This is why I'm so glad about the various outreach measures which the Heidelberg Laureate Forum and the Klaus Scherer Foundation have launched. All of us can do something to fan the flames of passion for MINT. Go and show your passion for this research to the outside world. Let others take part in the fascinating world of mathematics and computer science. Make presentations to the public, also in school classrooms, and make a valuable contribution to research and society. On this note, I wish you an inspiring time and lively discussions over the next few days. Thank you very much, and I hope it's a very good meeting here in Heidelberg. Thank you. Hey, Felix. What are some of your fondest memory of the two Heidelberg Laureate Forum that you have attended? Hmm. 
I highly appreciated all the exchange with young researchers. Well, one time I observed a phenomenon that I call the rare subject or mathematician on a party phenomenon. <laughs> If a ma mathematician visits a party and people ask her what she's actually doing, they suddenly leave when she tells the truth. <laughs> Similarly, the interest of um, others in your research uh, decreases rapidly if they cannot connect to it. And this happens in my research uh, on discrete holomorphic spinners. But fortunately, I could speak with Sir Michael Atia about them. He told me how he imagined spinners. And he mentioned a quite interesting experiment that physicists in Darmstadt did. They experimentally validated the atia singer index theorem on fullerene molecules. And their outcome reminded me on something that I observed for discrete holomorphic spinners. After Atiyah congratulated me for my choice of research topic, all people around me became suddenly interested <laughs> in my research and asked me for my publications. What about you, Momita? What is your most remarkable takeaway from, uh, from last year's participation as a young researcher? Yeah, mine is not as interesting as yours. <laughs> but I would say among the many takeaways, three are the most, yeah, well, you got my third takeaway. Uh, but among the three takeaways, the first was, of course, the amount of inspiration that you get from interacting with the laureates in such an informal setting where you get to hear their about their journey, about their success, and of course about their journey when they hit some roadblock. And I think that was just no other forum enables us to, as young researchers, to have that opportunity. And secondly, just making this highest achievement in computer science and mathematics a reality of, of hearing the stories from the laureates. And finally, the most uh, interesting and what I did not expect was the amount of connection that you make with young researchers. I now am still friends with many other young researchers that I met last year. And probably potential collaborations in the future because we also have some common interest in some, and some of them are working in optimization machine learning area as my, myself and we might collaborate in future. So young researchers, a word of warning, start networking or start making friends. <laughs> Momita, that was really interesting. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Let's see what the young researchers are actually thinking. We would like to show you videos from four young researchers who are going to tell you how mathematics and computer science are perceived in their home institutions and countries. And we also asked them about their expectation and excitement to attend HLF. And they shared us, four of them have shared some videos with us. Let's see what four of the young researchers have to say. Ciao, hello. I'm Luca Chidelli from Italy. Mathematics in Italy is considered to be the scariest subject in school and one of the least known and understood specialization from outside. Uh, though recently we had our second field medalist, Alessio Figalli, and this was big news and I think it helped to improve the public awareness on the subject. Also, despite chronic problems with respect to, um, so in, in education and uh, research in general, with respect to uh, funding, bureaucracy, career opportunities, mathematicians that fly away from the country, like me. Um, mathematics in Italy has a strong uh, tradition and I remember with deep fondness an environment um, that was beautiful and free for uh, learning, sharing of ideas and so on. Which by the way is the same type of environment that I expect to see and I already experienced in Heidelberg. So, happy HLF. Ciao, ciao. My name is Pooja and I work for Cisco Systems India. I have recently completed my master's in information security. In India, both computer science as well as mathematics are subjects that are really looked up to right from the school level. And I guess that plays a certain role in the rapid advancement of technology that is happening here. Needless to say, all the awards are perceived in a very high regard. And uh, it is going to be such an honor to be in the presence of all the esteemed laureates. The HLF is also my first international trip and it is such an amazing event that I am really looking forward to having the chance to meet all the laureates as well as all the young researchers from all around the world. And I certainly hope that they are all just as excited to meet me too. Hello, I am Amzo from Myanmar, Dr. Sura in Harvey Institute of Technology in China. My major is Mathematical Biology. I know about the film Turning Award and Maybelline Prize. 
These prizes are awarded for outstanding scientists while in the field of math. I expected too much idea from HLS forum. How to achieve the best results in my future research? Besides, I would like to learn how the prize winner mathematicians apply their thinking on math problem. Particularly, I am looking forward to studying postdoc in Germany and touching with German culture, sharing my country culture. I believe that HLF is one of the bridges between next generation and great mathematicians. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is May Rose Connor. I'm a second year undergraduate and I live in the United States. At my university, I have the honor and joy of being able to converse with two Fields medalists, one of whom is an Abel Prize winner. To hear the wisdom of the ages was truly a special treat and one that I hope to enjoy at this conference as well. I also hope to communicate with many of you as well as those of the last generation. I hope that this is an opportunity for all of us to share some wonderful mathematics together. Now we would like to call Theresia Bauer on stage, the Minister of Science, Research and the Arts in the state of Baden-Württemberg. Minister Bauer, the stage is yours. Dear State Secretary Meister, dear Rector Eitel, my esteemed greetings to the Chira family, and I welcome Countess Bedina Berdot and Mr. Turner from the Lindau Nobel Laureate meetings. I would like to thank Ms. Spiegel and Professor Reuter and the organizers of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, dear Professor Pancake, dear Professor Koenig, dear Professor Greiber, esteemed laureates, junior and senior scientists, dear ladies and gentlemen, I also would like to welcome you on the seventh annual Heidelberg Laureate Forum and thank you to the Klaus Schirer Foundation and the other award organizations that have made this event possible. Because beyond this forum, it is awards like the Abel Prize, the Fields Medal, the Turing Award and the Nevalina Prize that make outstanding achievements in mathematics and computer science known to the public. And these fields still do not receive the recognition they rightly deserve, but these highly prestigious awards make clear the importance of mathematics and computer science for our global society, economy, economy, and future. Because in the end, mathematicians and computer scientists are, in essence, first-class problem solvers. And we need problem solvers today more than ever, and urgently. This year's Hot Topics session says it all. It's focused on the potentially the greatest challenge of our time, something that for this past week at least, seems to finally be getting the attention it deserves. I'm of course speaking about climate change. However, many of you might see the actions of the past week and the climate plans and, initi initi and initiatives coming from the UN and the national governments and may think too little, too late, and I can agree on you half of that thought. Yes, we absolutely need to do more. The steps and solutions being proposed now are probably what we should have been doing decades ago. The need for action is enormous, and not only from individual countries or cities. This is about the environment and life on our planet. It is about global causes and effects, and it requires binding and determined action worldwide. And being said, I'm still a politician, and your basic mindset as scientists is rightly focused on curiosity and maybe even skepticism. But mine, my set is on optimism. 
It has to be. So it is absolutely not too late. And in the end, it doesn't matter if you are a skeptic, because we should agree anyways, we need to do anything and everything that we can do now to help secure our planet's future. And when it comes to acting and planning for this future, U.S. scientists provide the basis for our actions. You give us the information, data, and facts, and I'm talking about real, hard truth, non-alternative facts that guide our society, our policy, and debate. This is particularly true in the fields of computer science and mathematics, where you are using modern tools to transform our understanding of the world. The digital revolution has given us impressive way, new ways to help us protect our planet, but we need you to show us how to use them. We need you to interpret the enormous amount of data we have and put it to use. Problems on a global scale require, require global solutions, but that means also dealing with a lot of information Thank goodness we have you. Because who better than mathematicians and computer scientists to deal with big data? Now, I know it is a lot of responsibility to have, and I don't mean to pull all of pressure on you. Also a little bit, sure. But in the end, we know that we all must play our part Every society, nation, individual, and yes, politician, the pressure is certainly on all of us, and me too. That is the point of Friday for Fu Fridays for Future and Scientists for Future and the global strike we saw on Friday. We all must be involved. Yet as some of the greatest mathematici mathematicians and computer scientists today, you can do things that others simply cannot. Think of it like a superpower. Because beyond the use and the understanding of big data, we will need other tools and innovations, many of which you will discuss this week. For me particularly, quantum computing and the use of AI comes to mind, both being major focuses of our scientific policy in Baden-Württemberg. And as in many fields, mathematics and computer science are once again the fundamental disciplines here. Yes, as, I, as I said in the beginning, we need, we need you not only for computer science and mathematics superpowers, we also need you as problem solvers. That means we need your free thinking creativity and curiosity we need your fundamental, purpose-free research. We need both your ideas that help us today, but also the ideas that may only pay off in the future. This is the type of science that we are committed to in Baden-Württemberg, and I'm sure that it, this is also the case with the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. And that is why I'm sure you will have some fantastic discussions and exchanges this week. I hope that you will use this unique, exciting and inspiring opportunity to its full potential. It is a great chance for a scientific dia dialogue at its highest level, but even greater, it is one of the best opportunities to experience the pure joy of scientific knowledge and curiosity. And who knows, Maybe you'll even, even solve a few problems by chance along the way. So I wish you all a fantastic conference and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Teresa Barr. I would now like to invite Bernhard Eitel, the Hector of University of Heidelberg, on stage. Professor Eitel, the stage is yours. Okay. 
Now we heard in the, <clears throat> at the opening that everybody of us at least learned about six languages. And so therefore I, I try to start in German. Sehr herzlich begrüße ich Sie, liebe Frau, liebe Familie Chira und Sie ganz besonders, Frau Ehrensenator, Frau Chira, wieder einmal in der Aula der neuen Universität. Sehr geehrte Ministerin Frau Bauer, lieber Herr Staatssekretär Meister, liebe Frau Spiegel, lieber Herr Reuter. And now I switch over to English. Dear colleagues and laureates, dear young researchers. And embracing all not named participants, I use the Latin address honorabiles. It made everything a little bit shorter. It's my privilege and a great honor to welcome you, the participants of the seventh Heidelberg Laureate Forum on the city campus of Heidelberg University. The Heidelberg Laureate Forum picks up the idea of the Lindau event where the Nobel Prize awardees meet. And that's the moment to welcome Gräfin Bettina Bernadotte as re representative of the Lindau Conference. Many thanks for attending our ceremony. Supplementing the Lindau meeting, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum addresses mathematics, informatics, and the computational sciences. The unforgotten Klaus Schira, Messine and honorary senator of our university, he was right with his conviction that these disciplines are crucial for modern societies which face very complex challenges like the conversion of our societies and economics towards sustainable life without damaging our globe. It's interesting that this is in line with Chinese philosophy on harmony. And we just should remember our Chinese partners to their own traditions and cultural roots. Not one pathway, that's for us Europeans, not one pathway creates future. Different cultures and traditions guideline different societies to common goals. And we scientists know that different ideas can lead to the same solution and result. We just remember our traditions, our roots, and so we seek and we share common goals and we can reach them. Therefore, with respect to a growing world population, I'm deeply convinced that we only can save the planet, Minister Bauer mentioned it, if we use modern science-based new technologies to transform our practices. This is why an academic institution like Heidelberg University, which on the one hand roots in European history and on the other always contributed to the continuing renewing of our societies, is well suited to host such an event like the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Second, the university embraces well experienced scientists and young and dynamic researchers forming a powerful engine to explore the new, by new thinking, unconventional ideas, and out-of-the-box discussions. Third, last but not least, the university prepares a basis for new technologies and applications, for example, like the engineering of molecular systems based on a new understanding of life science processes, accelerating the substitution of metal-based industries by nanoscale, sea carbon based sustainable technologies, just like a kind of bionic dynamics, sustainable, non-toxic, and compostable. And mathematics and computer sciences, they play a crucial role. If we zoom into such new approaches to shape our future, mathematics, informatics, and the computational sciences are key disciplines not only for modeling, simulation, and optimization-related techniques and processes. Let, let's remember our policymakers and NGOs, both, and the young people. Science creates future. Optimism, curiosity, and intrinsic motivation are the food of science and research. Responsibility is our duty. 
no science, no future. Therefore, I am proud to state this is the right meeting with the right people at the right place and with respect to our global debates concerning the protection of environments, it's just in time. In this sense, I wish you all the best for your meeting. Thanks to the Foundation and the organizers. Thanks to you all for your lifetime you invest in the exchange between generations. And thanks for your friendship with Heidelberg and Heidelberg University. And addressing the young, if you will have the possibility for some minutes, some hours, try to escape the meeting, joining in a pub, tasting and smelling the good atmosphere of Heidelberg's environment. <laughs> All the best. Thank you very much. Before, Charles told us how music inspired her to become a mathematician and now how she now can even combine her two passions in a truly fascinating way. Let us now combine mathematics and visual arts. Let's do complex analysis together. Complex analysis is a theory of angle preserving maps in the plane. It has lots of wonderful theorems and important applications. It's the greatest theory God ever created. And you can produce amazing pictures. Let us start with the picture of a washing machine to understand um, angle preserving maps in the plane better. The picture, the washing machine, is continued periodically both in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction. We consider this plane as a plane of complex numbers. The origin is in the center, the horizontal direction is the real axis, and the vertical direction is the imaginary axis. An angle-preserving uh, map is now described by a holomorphic function in the complex plane. We will now have a look which color the image point f of z has on this picture of the washing machine and color the original point in this color. By this, we can nicely visualize holomorphic function. If we have the identity f of z equals z, nothing happens. The washing machine is not working. Let's start the spin cycle. f of z equals z cubed you can see uh, the threefold symmetry. And in the origin, something special happens. The derivative, three z squared, has a zero in the origin. That means that you have a branch point there. There, the angle is not preserved. 360 degrees became 1080 degrees. One sock became three socks. In reality, if you put three socks into a washing machine, you may only get one back. <laughs> but in mathematics, we don't have to care about reality. Let us have a look at f of z equals 1 over z. Now we have lots of washing machines. The function has a pole in the center, which means that in any vicinity of the origin, you can find infinitely many washing machines. Now it's your turn. Which function do you see? Any suggestions? Function is periodic, say 2 pi periodic. At plus pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, so you see branch points, so the derivative of this function is 0 there. At the origin, it behaves like f of z equals z. It's a sine function. Did you ever notice this particular beauty of the sine function? Thank you, Felix. Now, let's continue with some more exciting images or math functions beyond washing machine. Let's spin some fish. Yeah, that's ZQ. Now, let's consider a polynomial of penguins. Interesting. How about polynomial of Remensko? This is so beautiful. <laughs> Logarithmics of pineapple. 
A cosine of sundown. Tangent of the moon. Finally, bipolar function of chrysanthemum. Isn't that magic? You can see that we can indeed produce some nice piece of art using conformal maps. In fact, quite a lot of our young researchers sent us pictures, papers, and videos with their artistic performance, many more than we can actually show here. Nevertheless, we would like to present a few of them. Here's an image that Miao Han Long drew when she was in high school, before she had any real contact with physics and mathematics. She said, at this point, becoming a physicist was just a dream for her, according to her, which finally is true now. Besides being a postdoctoral researcher, Jiai Li, one of our young researchers, also owns a cafe in Netherlands and is a cake designer. On the left, you can see one with magic square on it, where all numbers on the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal adds up to 33, where the pronunciation of 33 in Chinese is Shun Ji Jian. I hope I did the right job is the same as the girl, girl's name that had happily received this cake. On the right, you see a meditation box that Cecilia Mosiri produced by carving a Shippinsky triangle into a piece of walnut on the right. Quite interestingly, a Shippinsky triangle was used for decoration purpose in ancient Rome many centuries before it attracted the interest of mathematicians. She leads to some quite beautiful mathematics is the art of folding paper, origami. On the left, Jane Tan arranged a star prism model. On the right, you can see an Alsacien, a woman in the traditional dress of the Alsace region, which is just 150 kilometers away from Heidelberg. Lisa and Yun Quang Zhao actually did not only send us this picture, but many, many more. This is still just a selection of all the origami she sent us. I have to admit that I have a rather special relationship to origami. Five years ago, I visited the summer academy where we discussed origami for two weeks. <laughs> but we were not folding paper, we were writing on paper. The origami we considered were coverings of the torus by closed oriented connected surfaces. It turned out later that these origami were a great source for my research on discrete holomorphic spinners, and since then, I really like origami, both as covering maps and folding paper. <laughs> great story. Now, we would like to invite the presidents of the Avo prize awarding institutes on stage. Cherry Pancake, president of the Association of Computing Machinery, Hans Peter Graver, director of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, and Carlos Kenning, President of International Mathematical Union. Hello. Okay. Is that one? Working. Three women, Shafi Golwasser, Barbara Leskov, and Francis Allen, have received the ACM AM Turing Award. Professor Pancake. What are your thoughts on why more women haven't received this award? What are some of the main challenges, according to you, in this respect? And what are some actions that institutes such as ACM can do to address this imbalance? The answer, in a way, is simple, but it's also a very difficult one to address. And that is that the Turing Award, like all of the ACM prizes, is the candidates are generated through nominations that come from anybody in the computing community. It's not a committee selecting who the candidates will be. And the honest truth is that even though women were discovering every year that more and more women have made foundational contributions ever since the earliest days of computing, they are not getting nominated for the award. I will tell you that we get many nominations each year, but we typically only get one woman nominee every, say, five years. Oh. And so it's really disturbing 
to the committee as well. We can't go out and solicit particular nominations because that wouldn't be fair when they're supposed to be coming from the community. But it is very disturbing not to get nominations when there are plenty of women out there who are probably very qualified to receive the award. Thank you so much for a wonderful answer. In mathematics, the situation is similarly extreme. In 2014, Maya Mizakani became the first and to date only recipient of the Fields Medal. This year, the Abel Prize laureate was for the first time a woman, Karen Uhlenbeck. Professor Koenig, what do you think of the reasons for the gender imbalance? What actions are taken by the International Mathematical Union to increase the visibility of outstanding female mathematicians? Well, uh, this is, of course, a very uh, crucial but very difficult question. Um, the roots of the, uh, uh, the process for the Fields Medal is different from the process to the ACM awards. But let me say that, uh, to me, the roots of the, of the problem lie in societal structures that have stilted the interest of talented women in the sciences. And this goes back to elementary school or even preschool. And I've seen that with my own children. So I think until that gets addressed, it will be very difficult to address the, the question in general. Now, uh, as far as your uh, question regarding what does the IMU do to address this issue, uh, slowly but surely the IMU has taken steps that have led to the increase, for instance, of the number of women speakers in the International Congress of Mathematicians. Uh, this has happened over the years and it steadily increases. Uh, as far as plenary speakers, for instance, the first one was in the 1930s, the second one was Karen Uhlenbeck in 1990. So uh, there was a gap of some 60 years. Now, uh, uh, this has been, uh, to a large degree, mitigated. Uh, the second thing uh, is all, all uh, IMU committees uh, have a, a gender balance in their formation. And so, w that's one of the elements. Another one is that uh, we distribute among all committee members uh, our policy on bias and implicit bias so that people who are in those committees can be sensitive to these issues. Uh, then uh, the IMU has a committee, uh, the CWM, Committee for Women in Mathematics, that's deeply committed to uh, the ideal of gender equality. Uh, this committee was created in 2015. Uh, uh, this year, uh, the International Science Council, ISC, created a, a, a study on uh, the, uh, how to measure gender inequality and how to remedy it. And uh, CWM is one of the two lead entities uh, in this committee and we will see the conclusions of this committee unveiled this November in Trieste at ICTP. So these are some of the ways that we're attempting to address this. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your insight. Professor Kava, may you report us about your experiences with gender diversity in the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters? Well, I, I think I agree with uh, much of what my two colleagues have said about the situation. And, uh, uh, but I think there's another aspect to it as well, and that is that since there are so few women about in the field of mathematics, uh, it's more difficult for them to uh, become visible to nomination committees and nomination uh, bodies. So I think increasing the visibility of the bright women that are out there is important. It's, it's a psychological fact, I think, that men more easily see men than they see women. Uh, and therefore, it's uh, very important to have uh, woman representation in the uh, nomination committee and our committee is uh, um, w we ask the IMU and the European Mathematical Society to uh, suggest 
candidates to our nomination committee and we asked them specifically mm -hmm. to nominate both men and women to this and uh, so, so we're very concerned about that aspect of it. Uh, but of course uh, until uh, more women have managed to work their way up in the field, this imbalance will continue, I think, unfortunately. Thanks. Data-driven analysis and data-driven approaches are becoming more and more important in today's world. Machine learning and artificial uh, intelligence require new mathematical computational models and ideas. Professor Kenning, do you think that these technologies will also change our ways to pursue mathematical research? And if yes, how would, you, how would it impact the field, in your opinion? Uh, well, I, I am certainly no expert on this subject. And there are many experts sitting in the audience. So I have to be very cautious here, <laughs> because my, my understanding <laughs> is very primitive. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I do believe that for instance, in artificial intelligence, the theoretical underpinnings of it are not yet clear. And that much more work would needs to be done in that direction. And that could possibly lead to new areas of mathematics. That's one example. In general, uh, I think it's too early to tell what the effect on mathematics will be. But I think we do have the experience of one field which is crucial, which is computer science, which has emerged uh, recently. And this has had a fantastic effect on mathematics. It has created new problems, new disciplines, and it's been a general boom for mathematics. So I hope that this will happen with the other new fields. Thank you for the insightful answer. So Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters exists since 1857. The members are divided into sections, mathematics and natural sciences, and humanities and social sciences. Looking back at the 162 years of history of the Norwegian Academy, how did it adapt to all the changes in society and science, Professor Kava? Well, the main mission of the Academy has always been the same, to uh, promote science and mm -hmm. to increase awareness and understanding of science in society. Uh, but of course, the activities needed have changed. It. Initially, in the beginning, much of the activities were directed towards publication, helping uh, scientists publish their work, and also to a certain extent financing uh, scientific yeah. experiments and expeditions and activities. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, uh, we're not a financing body, and we're not, we still have some publications, uh, but I think our main activities now in promoting science is uh, the prizes are very important, the Abel Prize and the Kabli Prize in uh, astrophysics and <coughs> nanoscience and neuroscience, uh, showing to the world the excellence of science and excellent scientists. I think that's a great way of promoting science and uh, increasing awareness yep. of it. Uh, another um, important aspect is um, uh, our science for policy uh, mm -hmm. activities. Uh, trying to bring together uh, scientists and politicians uh, and increasing the scientific basis of uh, uh, decisions taken in society that are important to the development of society. Thanks. The demand for computer science courses continues to grow all across the world. Professor Pancake, do you believe that all students, regardless of their field of study, would need to take at least a few computer science courses in the coming years or currently? If we're talking about computing related courses, absolutely. I don't think they're going to necessarily have the label of computer science 110 or informatics 141, but the notion of computational competencies, mm -hmm. understanding not just it's not just practically can you use a computer or can you use a smartphone, but the whole way of thinking and formulating solutions to problems, coming up with nonlinear and iterative and exponential types of thinking about the problems is really going to be important and understanding the notion of complexity as it applies to what machines might and might not be able to do to help you in another field. Thank you. 
We all know it's the names of the five uh, awards in mathematics and computer science who laureates are invited to attend the HLF. And we are glad to see so many laureates that are willing to spend the week with us, the young researchers. But we just know very little about the process which is um, undertaken before a new laureate is announced. Professor Kraber, would you like to tell us a bit more about the procedure that the Norwegian Academy does before the new Abel Prize laureate is announced? Yes, I'd be glad to. Uh, we, we have this uh, prize committee that is uh, established by the Academy mm -hmm. after uh, nominations from the International Mathematical Union and the European Mathematical Society uh, and it's chaired by a person nominated by us. Uh, and this uh, committee then decides on who to recommend as a laureate to the Academy. Uh, they receive nominations. Uh, we have a call for nominations every year, which is open to the public. Uh, the deadline just closed now, so it's not possible to nominate any longer for next year. But the committee is not dependent upon uh, the nominations, so they can... Uh, they can choose from previous year's nominations or they can also fill gaps if there is a, a person who obviously deserves the prize who has not been nominated. Mm -hmm. And they meet uh, twice uh, physically, uh, once in Oslo and once in another place of the world. There are uh, five people, they are prominent mathematicians among the leaders in the field. Uh, and they make their recommendation then to the Academy and the board of the Academy uh, makes the final decision on whom to uh, award the prize this year. Uh, the more specifics of the deliberation of the committee uh, are secret and uh, won't be available to the public for 70 or 80 years. Uh, but who's on the committee is public, so you can look in on our website and you find the names and uh, their affiliations. Well, thanks a lot for telling us a bit more. Thank you. Professor Pancake, ASIM awards two prizes, the Turing Award and the Prize in Computing. Would you be able to shed some light, some insight into the workings of the two committees and how they differ from each other? Well, some of the aspects are similar. In fact, the actual process is pretty similar. As okay. I said, we do an open call for nominations. Anyone can submit a nomination. You don't, even, you don't have to be a member of ACM or even in the field of computing. However, it's quite difficult to put together an entire nomination packet for these two very prestigious awards, and you have to have endorsements from a num another number of other people which okay. then they get invited to write endorsements. The committees then meet face to face, both of them, to look at, they often do an initial review to narrow it down to a field of what you might call semi-finalists, okay. and then they meet face to face to discuss those individual nominations in depth. The main difference really between the two is, is really what the committees are looking for, and that is the difference of what the prizes are intended to honor. I, I should have said at the beginning that we've had excellent gender balance in all our ACM committees for a couple of decades okay. at least. And if you have more questions, one of our awards co-chairs, John White, happens to be here at the meeting this time. Um, but the difference is that the Turing Award recognizes typically at least 25 or 30 years of impact since the original discovery or invention mm -hmm. because what it seeks to honor is something that has had a truly long-lasting and pervasive influence on computing. Mm -hmm. The ACM Prize it obviously, lots of contributions are made at different points in people's careers. And so the ACM Prize is looking more normally at the 10 to 15 year frame since the original discovery or invention. There has to have been promising impact, but not, needless to say, it won't have as much of an effect in terms of creating new fields, generating whole new types of technology as you do by the time you're 25 or 30 years past. Hope that awesome. helps. Yeah, thank you so much. Both the Fields Medal and the Nivalina Prize are awarded only every four years. 
Professor Koenig, do you think that it makes it this easier to select the overdies since you set up a committee only every four years? Or does it make it harder because so many mathematical breakthroughs are attained in four years? Well, let me take them one at a time. Uh, the, the Fields medals are awarded every four years, but there are four awardees. So that means that uh, year by year is more or less the same. I don't think that there's a substantial uh, difference. Now, where there is a difference in the fact that it's uh, awarded every four years is because there's an age limitation for the Fields Medal. So uh, you have to be 40 in the year of the award, um, at less than 40 on the year of the award. So for instance, if you are 37 on the, on the year where the Fields Medal is awarded, you will not have another chance. And if you happen to turn 40, you have three more years for production. So there's an intrinsic imbalance in there. Uh, there was a, a, an ad hoc committee of the IMU that studied this and related issues in 2014, and they were not able to find a solution to this. So th this is one intrinsic problem of the four-year cycle. Now, for, for the Nevanlina Prize, now the Abacus Medal, um, of course, there's only one awardee. Uh, but since the field in which the awardee is chosen is much narrower, then I don't think it's, uh, it impacts that as much. Thank you very much for giving us the consequences of a four-year cycle. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Pancake, Professor Kenning, Professor Grauer for being here and being, giving such candid, insightful answer. Thank you. Thank you. It was lo lovely talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We would now also like to take the opportunity to thank the entire team of HLF, whose tireless months of work made this incredible event a reality. Let's hear it for the entire HLF team. We now cordially invite you to a reception that is taking place in the Marstall Cafeteria. You can find the way just here on the map, but basically you just have to go straight to the river. Essentially, you can also just follow the music or the crowd. Tomorrow morning, we will meet again here at 9 a.m. For most of you, this is somewhere in the morning in your local time, but actually for a few of you, it's 5 p.m., <laughs> which means that you can sleep really long. For some of you, it corresponds to midnight in your local time, so we hope that you can find at least some sleep. In any case, we will meet here again at 9 a.m. Central European Summer Time. We would like to request all the laureates and the speakers to please approach the stage after the ceremony so that we can have a group photograph. So I think we gave Frankfurt Airport enough time to deliver your luggage. We do not want to let you wait any longer. <laughs> the Siebte Heidelberg Laureate Forum is eröffnet. The seventh Heidelberg Laureate Forum is now open.